Happy Thursday, everyone. This is Alex Volkov from Weights and Biases. And I bring you every first Thursday I... Today we had an incredible show, incredible live recording, and we overshot by 30 minutes. We usually set for two hours, and we had just a bunch of breaking news and surprises and authors from different places. It was all very exciting, and as always, I would like to bring you the recap of that show that I usually do during the live recording. At the end, I'm going to bring you the podcast listeners it here in the beginning specifically because this was a, a long show you'd be able to choose which of the things that we talk about you actually liked and if you listen to this on the apple podcast app or other podcasts that support chapters you'd be able actually to swipe down and jump to the chapter that you want Some additional, let's say, housekeeping here is that I've been listening to other successful podcasts in an effort to make the show better for you. And I would love to know what works, what doesn't. So definitely feel free to leave a comment on the Substack as a reply if you're subscribed to that. And if not, just hit me up on Twitter. I love feedback. I want to improve this as much as possible. And the recap is one result of this. I would love to know what works, what doesn't work. Please send feedback. And if you don't have any feedback and you're only feedback, hey, this is great. I love it. Like many of you have been telling me, uh, the best way to show your appreciation is to actually give us some upvotes and some stars in the Apple podcast. This actually really helps. This is how the internet works, apparently. And yeah, would love to see our podcast grow. I will say that recently, Thursday, I broke the top 50 in the U.S., tech news category for Apple Podcasts. I think we'll end up like number 23 at some point. So this obviously fluctuates from week to week, but I was very surprised, honored, humbled, excited, all of these things, just to see that uh, tech news as a category, uh, we're breaking not only the top 50, but the top, let's say 30. I definitely thought that our content is more niche, but it looks like more people are enjoying AI. So with that, help us get more eyes on this. I know that many folks learn through Thursday Eye, which is awesome. And I'm now going to put the music up again and give you the recap. Again, this recap was recorded at the end of the conversation where I knew everything we actually talked about. And then this will slide to a conversation. We had quite an incredible show. So there we go. All right, recap time. So today is February 1st. And here's the recap for Thursday Eye, February 1st. Everything we've talked about, it's been a whole month of 2024, and we're covering just the week. And we talked about incredible amount of stuff today. So in the area of open source, we covered Code Llama 70B that Meta released and gave us. It achieves a 67.8% on human eval evaluation. It's a coding model. We got three models. We got the base one, instruct one that sometimes refuses to write the code that you want, and also the Python specific one, and a bunch of fine tunes already in place. So for example, the SQL fine tune already beats GPT-4 at text to SQL generation, which is super cool. I think it's already up for them on Hugging Chat and Together and other places. Really, the industry adopted the Code Llama uh, it released with the same license as well, so it's commercially viable. Incredible release for Meta, and we're just getting started with the fine tunes. Speaking of fine tunes, and speaking of different things to use it for, Together AI added function calling for open models like Mistral, Mixtral, and Code Llama. So, like a day after Code Llama was released, now you're able to get it in function calling mode and JSON mode thanks to Together. And Together is generally awesome, but this specific thing is I wanted to shout it out. We then we talked about this ominous 
Miku model that performs very well. And folks were thinking that maybe this is a leak. And then we covered that Mistral our CEO, Arthur Mensch, confirmed that this is an old version. So this is indeed a leak. It leaked in the quantized version and it's up now on Hug and Face. Leaks are not cool. And the way that Mistral handled this, we think, I personally think is like super cool. Kudos to them. They confirmed that this is like an old version of something they trained. They also confirmed that this is a continued training of a Llama 2 model. So not a full a pre-train like Mistral 7B, for example. There were some speculations to this. There was also some speculations where Mistral Medium, is it an MOE or not an MOE? Is it a mixture of X or not? This potentially confirms that it's not. Although we don't know fully whether or not this is Mistral Medium, we just know that it answers like one and performs and benches like one. Pretty cool to see the folks from Mistral said that it happened to them, but uh, pretty cool to see how they reacted to this. We covered, and we had the great, uh, awesome honor to have uh, Eugene here, Pico Creator. We covered RWKVs, no, new non-transformer-based, RWKV-based Eagle 7B model. And we we, do, we we did a little deep dive with uh, Pico Creator later in the show about what RWKV means and what quadratic attention, what problems it comes with and what the future holds. It was a great conversation. Uh, RWKV is part of the Linux Foundation, so committed to open source. Like Eugene said, they threw away the keys and it will be always open source. A uh, really great effort and hopefully to see more from there. If that interests you, definitely listen to the next uh, to the second hour. Then we talked about embeddings and we had quite a few almost aka breaking news stuff about embeddings because uh, BAAI, if you remember the BGE embedding models we've talked about on MTB leaderboard, uh, BGE is, I don't honestly remember the acronym, they released the M3 version of their BGE embeddings and they have been on the top of the leaderboard for embeddings for a while. Now they released a multilingual embedding update, so they support more than 100 languages, which is incredibly important because in the pursuit of open source embeddings, many people turn to OpenAI just because they support more languages. And most of the up and coming embedding models in open source, they only support it like English or English and Spanish or something like this, or maybe English and Chinese. That's a, a very popular pair. But now BGE supports more than 100 languages. They also support AK context. And there are also multifunctional embeddings, whatever that means. We'll have to read the technical report, but it's going to be in the show notes. 8K context is also very important. On the top of, uh, topic of embeddings, a company called Nomic that we've mentioned before with the product called Atlas. Nomic released their embeddings, and not only they released the embeddings, they committed to fully open source, where they released the training data as well. They released a reproducible way of getting those embeddings, and they claim that they beat OpenAI's previous auto models and the fairly newish OpenAI text embedding models as well, at least the small ones. So OpenAI just upgraded their embedding endpoints as well. So a lot of stuff is heating up in the embedding area, which we understand why it's important because many people do RAG and retrieval augmented generation and they need embeddings, uh, but also for other purposes as well. So very interesting embedding day or week. We also had the great pleasure to also have breaking news because as we were starting to space, I got maybe seven DMs from different people, including one of the authors for a uh, model called Olmo from the Allen Institute or AI2, Allen Institute for AI. So Nathan Lambert joined us uh, briefly to talk about how they're committed to understanding and releasing as much as possible in the open source. So this model is not, it's beating Llama 7B, it's beating other places. It's not, it's running a thing behind Mistral a little bit. And Nathan attributed this to just the amount of compute and the amount of data that they're throwing at it. However, Olmo from Allen Institute of AI released in everything open source as much as possible. Uh, Nathan highlighted how much of it is released. And if there's something that didn't release and you want to release from them, like I asked for the weights and biases logs and he said, okay, we'll look into this, um, which they used for this model, which is awesome. They released like full checkpoints every 500 steps, code to train, data, like everything. Incredible effort in learning and building these models. And so check out almost 7B and the Allen Institute of AI. Nathan is also very incredibly smart AI researcher and very worth follow. He writes a very popular blog called Interconnects. I will recommend this on our Substack as well. So great conversation with Nathan. I did not expect him to Japan, but hopefully he's now a participant in the spaces. Then we moved to 
discuss data sets. We had a new segment this week, specifically because there was a, a few very interesting updates. So first of all, the Capybara data set from LDJ, who joins the spaces and co-hosts often, is now DPO'd by folks from Argia AI. So like it turns into a direct reference optimization version of the data set, which we saw that does very like good performance on models if we train them in the DPO way. And this has been released by the folks from Argia, and Argia is like open source worth mentioning because we already saw multiple stuff that they do to improve data sets and then retrain them on already existing fine tunes to make them do better. So this is in this case also what they did. There's a model now that beats, I think, neural Hermes by a few points just because this data set was like higher quality and DPO as well. And then we moved in the, the data set section, we moved towards uh, talking about the Hermes or, or Hermes data set that Technium has been painstakingly working on. It's a million records data set that news research and Technium has used to release every, anything from a 7B model. There was a Mistral 7B Hermes up until to like a 34 fine tune on, on top of Yi that was very well performing. And that data set is now out. It's possible for you to use this. It includes a bunch of other data sets in it. So we've talked about that. And the way to visualize this data set, we had a long conversation with folks uh, from Lilac. So uh, Nikhil and Daniel from Lilac, uh, we talked about what uh, segmentation means and how these data sets are getting visualized and how it's very difficult to actually read millions of lines of text, nobody can do this, uh, or actually segment them on your computer and understand what it includes. Just imagining like a million lines of million like records of text. Uh, so uh, Lilac, uh, we went into a conversation about how to cluster that data set, how to understand what's in it, how to search it, how to segment and see the segments and how to figure out how much of the data set more or less of something you want a super cool conversation very worth your time it's probably going to get released as a separate episode because it's a deep dive incredible and definitely give them, those folks a follow we then had the deep dive into lava 1.6 from from the folks uh, how Tin Liu and some other folks behind lava uh it's an open source vlm vision language model that is the backbone of it is the Hermes 34 billion parameter from news research. That's the kind of the textual brain. This Lava release uh, is the best open source VLM that we currently have. It includes support for higher resolution. It includes incredible OCR for open source. Like really, I played around with this pasted text. It's quite convincingly incredible. It achieves state of the art in open source models and beats the previous attempts as well and we've talked about why and how it does that and it's like very cool as well we also briefly mentioned that in the voice and audio category there is now a way to run whisper directly on ios devices the folks from arg max open arg max released uh, something called whisper kit which is a, a way for you to run whisper in a very optimized way we also mentioned parakeet from nvidia that's beating uh, performance and uh, we then mentioned that Bard with Gemini Pro on the LMC Serena, which is the way for us to know which models are good based on human preference, is now the second best LLM in the world, which was a surprise to many of us. Uh, and we talked about potentially why and definitely worth uh, checking out that conversation. And also LDJ hinted about something that's upcoming on the LMC Serena that could be super cool, a very mysterious deluxe chat something that uh, achieves potentially state of that performance on open source will keep you in the loop after we, we learn more details as well. And I cover the open AI uh, new mention feature where you can add mention and share contacts between different GPTs. If you talk with my GPT, you can suddenly summon another one and that other one will have the context of your conversation in it, which is super cool. And one thing I didn't mention, I really wanted to mention is this unique use case for Llama, which is a game called Infinite Craft from Neil, Neil.fun. This is the URL, Neil.fun slash Infinite Craft. It's really addicting. I didn't want to mention this so far because literally your Thursday will not be productive if you start playing this game. But it's a game where you combine concepts. You just drag names on top. You start with earth, wind, something, and fire. And then you drag stuff on top of each other. And then they use this LLM to combine this concept into one concept. And you keep going all the way up until you get Homer Simpson, for example, or the Avengers or whatever. It's really a fun way to check out as something that only LLM can build. And I think this is most of what we talked about. I think we've talked about multiple other stuff, but this is the gist of the conversation. All right, this was the recap, and I guess we'll start with open source.
Open source AI, let's get it started. All right, let's get it started. We have this nice transition here. And then we will first start talking about Code Llama. <laughs> of course, Code Llama. Code Llama is quite the big news from, from the goats at Meta uh, because um, we've been waiting for, for something like this. Llama, when it was released, it was not that great on, on coding necessarily. And we already had Code Llama before. Uh, I think 34B, if I'm not mistaken. And this time, Meta releases called Llama 70. They kept training this. They gave us uh, a few, they gave us three models, correct? They gave us the the instruct model, they gave us the base model, and also the Python-specific model that, that is significant in performance. What I love about the open source here, the open source area, is that how fast everybody started like saying, okay, we will give you code Llama. Because super, super quick, Hugging Face released an instruct version on Hugging Face. It's supported in Hugging Chat. I think Perplexity also serves this. Then together, in like less than a day, together decided, hey, we're now putting out Code Llama and it's supporting the function calling stuff that we're going to talk about in a second. Very impressive. Point eight on human eval, which is not the best that we had in open source, right? So Meta didn't come out and said, hey, this is the state of the art open source coding model. I think DeepSeek and, and other areas were even better in code. However, we know that every meta release is not the final release. We know that every meta release is coming up to open source and then uh, fine tuning. And so we definitely already saw quite a few fine tunes. Great release from from meta. Oh, and also uh, the thing to mention it has 16,000 context window, which is great for code. And it's been trained for longer sequences of code as well. Supposedly, hopefully, we'll spit out longer longer tokens and a lot a lot more code. Um, I think that's all I had. Oh, no, I also had uh, a thing that to mention that it's already been quantized for MLX. And we've talked about MLX, the kind of the Apple built inference engine, I guess, on Apple Silicon. And it has several fine tunes. And the fine tune that I wanted to highlight is SQL Coder uh, because they fine tuned like super quick on Code Llama. And then they beat GPT 4 on a bunch of like specific S SQL queries. And SQL Coder is now probably the top SQL, text to SQL model in the world. Anything else on Code Llama folks here on stage that want to chat? Nissan, go ahead. Yeah, there are a few things here. So it's true that DeepSeek and DeepSeek, I think 6.7b and 33b, which is also what Miguel's White Rabbit Neo is based off the cybersecurity LLM. It is true that they do feel better when you use them in comparison to using Code Llama. However, the good thing about having a 70B for doing fine tunes is that larger models do better with longer context lengths. Uh, as we've seen before with the Yarn models, the, the Yarn 7B, yeah, they have 128K context length, but it's there's not enough meat, so to say, in there in the model for it to be good at, at those long contexts. And from what I know from other people running stuff in production, and at scale, uh, they would all say, if you want to get reliable function calling, you, you need to go with the, with a larger model and preferably at at least 8-bit. And because this was one of the few things they, they would notice. Now, this is probably going to change with further architectures, but that's just how it is right now. So again, if you're going to use it yourself for looking up code snippets or fixing stuff here and there, you might be better off with one of the smaller ones. However, overall, I think we'll see better fine tunes and better tools, especially for longer context stuff where you can just dump in the whole code base and then get stuff out of it. Yeah, and, and my last comment is that they had RLHF, the instruct version, too much to the point where it won't even answer it, it thinks it's unsafe to talk about building stuff on Mars or making, uh, I saw that. adding buttons to websites. <laughs> I saw that. Thank you, Nissan. Yeah, definitely. The bigger the model is, it's not only about evaluations. We keep saying evaluations are not broken to an extent, etc. But it's not only about evaluations and how well it performs on different areas. It's definitely bigger models. We know that they perform better on different summarization tasks as well. And uh, yeah, Yasin, what's up? Welcome in. This is your second appearance, I think, here. Do you, have you played with Code Llama? You want to comment on it? Oh, uh, what's up, everybody? Llama, let's go. Has anyone used it for the work yet? I like probably could happily replace a GPT-4 very, very begrudgingly 
And that is like the thing that I do. So when these models come out, I load up the most convenient interface and then I try it. And then if I, and then I measure the performance based on how long it takes me to go back to GPT-4. And I'm pretty sure that I could be very productive with the internet disconnected and having this thing running. It's good. I think on that topic, I saw someone and so this thing, this specific thing running is hard on, on your Mac, but it's possible. It's not like if it's quantized, it's on, on the bigger Silicon Macs. I think it's possible now to run this, even though it's 70B. Yes. Yeah, so you're, you're going to need at least 40 gigs of, uh, of VRAM to, to get, to get good performance, because once you go to uh, four bit and, and below it, it really starts to, um, to do great. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I've, I've used the other 70 B as well daily, uh, for the last few days, which is uh, what we're going to talk about, but yeah, one, one more thing in, in open source, not as, as much related to this, but the people that built Atom and Electron, they also built this other ID development environment called Zed and they just open sourced it. And Zed has, they are about to push some pull requests to allow other assistants on it. And I was trying myself, but I'm not a rust of. And so pretty soon you will have other IDEs that are very fast and that you can just connect. You can have a cursor like experience, like the cursor app that you can just use at home. Because otherwise you're, you're stuck with other Vim or Emacs if you want to use this as a, as an integrated development environment, if you want to use the, the code. But yeah, just shout out to Zed for open sourcing. Definitely there. shout out to Zed. There's, and and, and where, where it connects with what Yasin just said is that many of us like expect at some point to be fully offline and running these tools like Copilot. I saw some stuff, and I think I mentioned this before on, on Thursday, I, where you could fake a copilot end endpoint with a proxy and you can go into settings in VS code and say, Hey, my copilot actually sits in this URL and then serve local models and have copilot, but it talks to code llama. I haven't tried this yet, but I I agree with you. The, the metric of how fast you go back to GPT-4 is a very good metric, especially because metrics are a little broken. So let's move forward from code llama. Yes. Oh, yeah, that, go ahead, go ahead. There's one more way for those locally, either Windows, Mac or Linux, just go in your host file and change the open AI domain to your local host or your, whatever your home 192.168 server you have, and then it will route to that. So there's an even easier way, then you don't have to change the configs of, of other models, but yeah, we're, we're almost there. We're almost the great decoupling is almost here. And as always, pretty much in here. shout out to the goats at Meta AI for giving us more and more open source and cool stuff. I think the thing to mention here, in addition, that folks from Together AI and Together, we've mentioned it before, they have, they serve models. They also lead to fine-tuned models. We did the hackathon together with them, with Ways and Biases and Together. They super quickly added Code Llama, but also the thing to call out for Together specifically is because there's m multiple folks serving free models. Together is uh, definitely fast. They just added function calling in JSON mode. And I think it's important for the AI devs in the crowd that we're getting so spoiled by open AI and function calling was super cool in JSON mode. I don't think anybody came close to create, recreate the assistance API area in the open source, but definitely I know that Llama CPP and LM Studio as well, and I think some others, they expose a local server that kind of behaves like, it behaves like the open, uh, open AI API. So you can just like quickly just exchange the open AI endpoint in the calls. So definitely together is doing that, but together is going further and giving us function calling, which was missing. And we talked about this a little bit with Jason from instructor library last time. And so that's super cool and shout out together for this. And hopefully the folks from together are going to keep, keep releasing interesting things like they did before. And they, they do quite a lot for open source as well. Together also has the, the folks the, behind Hyena architecture. If you guys remember, we talked about Hyena. And the goat behind Flash Attention, Tree Dow is, I think, chief scientist in Together. So definitely worth a, a check out if you're planning to work with these like open models and want some more stuff. Definitely worth a shout out. So I want to hit the, this breaking news button for a second because we have some breaking news. As I was sent this news just before we started the space, and I invited Nathan here to, to join us. So I'm going to hit this button and then we're going to chat with Nathan. 
AI breaking news coming at you only on Thursday I makes me feel like a full-on radio talk show host i want to say that the breaking news we got a couple but the, definitely the breaking news from Allen institute i received it in the form of another magnet link on nathan twitter so nathan welcome to the stage to the show this is the first time here please introduce yourself briefly and then we can chat about the interesting stuff Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. My name is Nathan Lambert. I'm a researcher at the Allen Institute for AI. I also write a somewhat popular ML blog, interconnects.ai. I don't know how to quantify popular there. But yeah, happy to be here, share what I we built. It. It's great. And <laughs> you, so just to shout out Interconnects just super quick. Last, I want to say, Sunday, I released the conversation with Maxime Lebon that about merging that some of you who are frequent here probably heard live, but it wasn't released in podcast form. And then in that, I, I mentioned, Nathan, I mentioned you in that newsletter because you s- s- quote tweeted something and you said, oh, I have to pay attention into this merging thing. And then on Interconnects, you released this like opus, this essay, this incredible deep dive, way deeper than I even would imagine to attempt about where merging started and when it went. So definitely, if folks are interested in finding out everything about merging that's possible, and you already read Maxime's kind of essay on Hug and Face, Interconnects is the place to go. So definitely thank you for that. It was a very yeah. impressive read. Thanks for the shout out. I don't know how long it took you, but definitely for folks who want the deeper stuff, Interconnects is a great place. But this is not the reason why you're here, here on stage, and this is not the reason why I hit the breaking news stuff. Could you talk a bit about why you're dropping magnet links on Twitter as though you're from Mistral? Yeah, the magnet links and the word art is purely to increase visibility of this model. The model is available on Hugging Face. It's this Olmo model, which is named after Open Language Model. It's the first model in a series from AI2 to try to really release a actual open source model. There's there's always so many asterisks on saying ML is open source, but so is it in a practical sense, make it as close to that as you can. And at the same time, be state of the art. I think the core takeaway, for, the core lesson that I think people later on this year will get around to is what a state of the art language model means now. And you can take into the weeds so much for evaluations for a base model. AI2 did this a lot. You can see the paper, blog post, whatever, that lists the evaluations that we use. But A, it's really hard to evaluate base models. So like the like base leaderboard is partial coverage there. And then B, everyone knows scaling laws are about the compute needed for parameters and data. So then we have to start evaluating models on a per token basis, as well as just their raw performance. So that's why if you look at this, we compare to Llama. And among the models where we know the token count, Almost 7B is equivalently state of the art. There's also a 1B model and training a bigger model is underway. And that big thing that's everyone thought what about Mistral and the rumors are that Mistral is trained on way more tokens and we don't know. And it's we beat Llama by training on 20% more tokens, but Mistral might be trained on 300% more tokens. <laughs> so we don't really know. But it, it's in the ballpark of a model that's Llama 2 caliber, people will be able to use this and we're excited to see what research people do from there. That's awesome. And could you talk about like the, the completeness of, you mentioned this briefly, but the completeness of the open, like end-to-end openness. I think we've heard folks talk about this multiple times where what's open, what's considered open source? If somebody drops just a weights file, is that open source? Do they open source the training parameters? Do they open source the data set? Do they open source the, the different things? From our perspective, with advisor, do they show you the loss curve as well? Could you talk about a little bit of that approach and what you guys want to show about, about that with, with OMA? Yeah. So the one that normally get people gets people stuck is releasing the actual exact data that the model is trained on. And then the second one that gets people stuck is release the training code. Essentially, Olmo has everything. I could try to list through them, but there are so many things to say that I honestly always forget one or two. It's the data is released exactly. The model is released. We trade the 7B model. We trained on multiple types of hardware. So there's like an NVIDIA version and an AMD version. The checkpoints are released for every thousand steps. There's 500 checkpoints per model on Hugging Face. The training code is released. The evaluation code is released. You know, like not a Val washing paper is released. 
I don't know what else you want. Like some things like demo and instruction models are coming soon. But if there's something that you want, we are either trying to release it or already have some of the things like weights and biases logs are just like tricky to get through permissions and stuff. As in like, how do you actually, so I, didn't, I didn't even realize it was a weights and biases podcast, but we're just trying to get these last things out. If we have issues with that, I guess I know where I can ask. <laughs> I didn't even think about it on our to-do list. Absolutely. Uh, this is the eye coming to you from Weights and Biases. We definitely would love to see the tracking and everything. One shout out I want to say is the Wing here. Wing from Axolotl releasing just reports full of uh, different charts and everything. Nathan, so this is great. And you, you mentioned briefly you're training a bigger model. Can you give us a little hint about this or are we going to have to just sit and wait? Yeah, yeah, we are. It's in the official communications and it's been in official communications for a while. But it's just takes a little bit more research wrangling to train a 70B model, but 65 or 70 is the plan. And I don't like, <laughs> there's a lot of wait and see there. I can't really keep performance because we have to go out and do it, but we're going to go do that right. and get back to you. Awesome. When you do, please feel free to welcome, be welcome back on the stage here on Thursday. I, and definitely a shout out for releasing everything as, as much as possible. And like you said, if, if there's anything you guys didn't and folks in the community maybe want to hit up Nathan and uh, AI2 or Allen Institute of AI, I guess that's why it's AI2 because it's AI. Did I get it right? Yeah. Allen Institute is AI and then for AI is AI2. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it shouldn't so be too much. It's, it's, it's easy to find. Yeah, easy to find. Follow Nathan, follow uh, AI2 on Twitter. Thank you for releasing everything as, as much as possible, including training code. Definitely support for the community. And then we'll mention this in the show notes as well for folks who are listening. Nathan, feel free to stick around on stage as we talk about some stuff that you talk about. I, in additional semi-breaking news, but from the tradition of talking about the things that we have the authors for, I want to chat about RWKV, the Eagle 7B a little bit. And I want to welcome... Where's my friend Eugene? Is he was on stage just before? Let's see. Oh, looks like maybe we lost him. All right. So let me briefly mention RWKV, the 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 model. However, there's the transformers that we all know and love, and many of the models that we talk about are based on the transformers architecture. And there's quite a few architectures that are mm, trying to break the quadratic attention problem with transformers. RWKV is one of them based on, I want to say RNN. I see Luigi, you, you want to do this intro? I think you introduced me to RWKV. Yeah, sure. I think you're actually giving a decent explanation, but yeah, I would mostly say it solves the, or it, it strives to try and solve the quadratic scaling problem of every time you double the context length, usually in transformers, you end up doing something like 4xing the multiplying by four the amount of memory you're using and the amount of slowdown you're causing. And that's what things like Mamba and Hyena and RetNet and RWKV are all trying to solve in different ways. And the RWKV originally started actually from being inspired from a paper by Apple back in, I think, 2020 or 2021 called Attention Free Transformer. And then since then, this guy named Blink Dio, <clears throat> sorry, a guy named Blink DL has just been working on this with a bunch of other people and upgrading and changing and modifying things for years now, all the way up to this point. Now they're on RWKV5. So this latest release uh, from RWKV is called Eagle. It's a 7B model, and apparently it's uh, quite performant. However, there's also a demo. I played with it, and I got to say, the, the, the Nisa, go ahead. I think you have a comment as well. Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind it's not trained for as much as something like Mistral probably was. I think it's probably most fair to, I think this one's only trained for 1 trillion tokens. So I think the most fair comparison would actually be Llama 17B. Mm. And then once it gets to 2 trillion tokens, then it would be fair to compare against Llama 27B, etc. Yeah, so it's like hard to exactly be able to compare, but it looks like it's probably it scales well. I used the previous version a lot and it, it did feel faster. Also, I want to say now RWKV has been part of the Linux foundation for a few months. So again, just because it doesn't feel or doesn't reason as well as a Mistral model, which has yet to be proven, does not mean that this is not going to be useful. It, it, 
because it, it scales so well at larger contexts, it might actually perform better there where, for example, you just dump in a whole book or a whole code base and, or just dump in like 300,000 words or, or whatever. So it, it has a lot of potential in that regard for those uses. I have yet to test how it runs on CPU, so that, that might be useful there as well. But again, it's super interesting because it's not really the usual transformer based one. And yeah, it, it has been around for a while. And it goes to say that the transformers are not a, a dead end and we're going to see a lot more improvements in coming just from architecture changes. Yeah. So we, we definitely want more improvements for architecture changes. Definitely. We've talked about the hyena architecture from together. We've talked about Mamba, the state the space the state models. I think I mentioned this tidbit before, but I got a, a brief chance to meet and take a picture with Jan Lecun on, on uh, in Europe. And the only thing that I could come up with, I literally had a minute there is to ask him about like state space models and just the meh that Jan Lecun gave me. It was really funny, like a very specific meh about state space models. And then he said something about we're working and the have been continuous attempts at like changing transformers. Uh, we're still, we're still not there in terms of uh, completely being able to replace, but a very interesting area of research and some combination probably between transformer, like attention based stuff and the infinite context links with RNNs could be very interesting and uh, RWKV, the, the latest eagle, if anything, and I added a tweet here, uh, and I'll add to show notes from uh, Yam, who's dug into this uh, more deeply, so you can follow that thread as well, that the continued training will show promise, hopefully, for the RWKV, and uh, hopefully at some point we'll get uh, the folks behind RWKV. It looks like we had some connectivity issues for this time. All right, moving on here, uh, moving on to, I guess we should talk about... MQ. <laughs> um, let's talk about MQ, folks. So, uh, I don't know who wants to start. Nisten, do you want to start? LDJ, you want to start? Just briefly, folks, I, I don't want to cover like, the, this whole space with, with MQ, but definitely this next thing happened. Somebody dropped uh, a very performant, quantized version of a model called MQ on, I guess, Hugging Face, and I think it originated from probably 4chan everything originates on 4chan right the the waifu uh, nathan you called them the, the waifu diffusion army or so, something similar right waifu research department <laughs> the waifu research department it's a real hugging face org that's where i got that oh so it wow. has real models and data sets and stuff on it it's, i didn't make that up it's they have 150 members it's hilarious oh i see okay so i thought that you're like calling everything that happens in the places that i don't frequent which is like 4chan and everything that waifu research department but it's a real org good to know so shout out waifu research department but also as some of these things go especially the leaks and everything they originate in areas like 4chan maybe local llama on reddit and the folks started talking about MIQ, M-I-Q-U, which is a model that wasn't clear where it came from, but it performed very well, very, I won't say very well. And the folks started thinking about, hey, potentially this is a leak of one of the bigger companies. And I think, I don't know if I'm doing the whole thread justice, but I think at some point people hinted that this could be Mistral or, or Mistral based or maybe Llama based. So I want to hear from two folks but in an orderly fashion, because Nista, I followed your threads on this, and then Luigi, I followed some of the stuff that you, that you mentioned from this. Where are we at the end of this? Because I definitely want to mention Arthur's involvement in, in announcing the leak, but walk me through of like how this model performs if you downloaded it. Nista, I think you did. Let's talk about this. I downloaded it before I, I knew what it was to check, and the first check came out that this is exactly like Llama 70B, the architecture, the shapes, the weights. And uh, we had heard, we'd heard earlier rumors that Mistral Medium was a 14B aid expert. I had led me to dismiss this. Also, I'd done the prompt template wrong, so I, I wasn't getting the exact result. Uh, but I think now you got the verdict, fact checked yeah. by, by, by the goat himself, Georgi Gerganov. Was that <laughs> yeah, by Georgi Gerganov <laughs> on having misconstrued. He's Peter like, Kampus, no, Nistan, you used my thing wrong. The creator of Lama yeah. CVP. <laughs> oh, yeah, put the prompt template wrong. That was great. Which was, which was pretty epic. That was an epic mistake. Yeah, a anyway, people ran benchmarks. Actually, Technium ran the benchmarks. 
and it performs very close to the Mistral Medium API. And now other things that people have noticed, it is a Q5KM, so it's a five bit quantized model. So that, that means it's going to be maybe like a percent off or two on the benchmark. So it could be very close, but it looks like that either this is an early version of Mistral Medium that got leaked and was sent to customers or is it could still be that Mistral Medium is an MOE, just a much more efficient one. And this was trained on the same data. So just to so, be clear, we didn't get an MOE model out of this, right? So this is a quantized it's one It's a model. Llama 70B. Yeah. Exactly. It's exactly like every other Llama 70B fine-tune in terms of the files. Okay, like, so we're still pre-Arthur's announcement. Luigi, go ahead. You have your hands up. P pick it up from here. Yeah, so something that I feel like is interesting in terms of Mistral Medium API is if we want to speculate if it's MOE or, or what is it based off or if it's based on an existing architecture or whatever, I think there is actually evidence pointing towards it being like Llama based or a continued pre-training of existing Llama model, like maybe Llama 7DB, because if you look at the tokenizer for Mistral and the Mixtral 47B model, those are like, th th that's the Mistral tokenizer that if they wanted to keep making their own models completely from scratch, they probably would use that same tokenizer. But you can actually see that the way the Mistral media model tokenizes things is actually closer to how Llama 7B tokenizer tokenizes things. And if you just do continue pre-training instead of training completely from scratch, that's a situation where you'd end up at, like continuing to use the Llama tokenizer. So I'm not sure why they would use that tokenizer for Mistral Medium if it was trained completely from scratch on their own mixture of experts architecture. So I just want to like uh, uh, chime in here real quick. We got this model. It performed really good. It had like good evaluations. Some folks like kept saying this could be this, this could be that. We had speculation before that because the guys behind Mistral first dropped the 7B model, then the mixture of experts that we've talked about ad nauseum, I think at this point, like a very good open source model, they also released Mistral Medium in their API without dropping this open source for everybody else. And the Mistral Medium was like significantly well performing on LMCs Arena as well. We, there was speculation that's also like a mixture of experts, but bigger one. And so this didn't fit the narrative that what we got is a a leak from the bigger mixture of experts. However, because this was like one model that's similar to, to Llama 70B. But then we got official news from Arthur Mensch, the CEO of Mistral, that I got a shout out. Everything they do with style, I don't know where they like learned this method, but if you remember the magnet link, if you remember the logo that's word art, I don't know what, like, where in France they teach you how to be very stylish about everything, but definitely they handled this potential leak news with that flair as well. So really want to shout out. Arthur came out and said that, hey, indeed, one of the earlier clients, or I guess one of our one of our partners in the early stages of the company, one of their like <laughs> overzealous employees released the Swades file and leaked the Swades file of an earlier model that we've trained super quick on Llama because we, we, we were like running to get started. And this is around the, the language that he used. He didn't say Mr. Medium. So when I posted my stuff and the folks who found out through me, I apologize. I said he confirmed Mr. Medium. He did not confirm Mr. Medium. He did confirm that this is a leak from one of the big companies from Mistral. He also mentioned, he also changed his tweet. He edited it from, I went and looked and tried to figure out what, what the change was. He said earlier version, and then he changed it to old version. So I don't know if that means anything. However, so we don't have a full confirmation from them that this is indeed Mistral Medium. We do have a confirmation that unlike the 7B Mistral, this big model was not trained from scratch. And he also said we moved on from there. So we don't know still whether or not Mistral has a, a whole, uh, if Mistral Medium is a, is a full creation of their own. But there's zero doubt in my mind, that Mistral folks are capable of doing like a Mistral medium from scratch. Specifically, there's zero doubt in my mind because I went and looked and it's probably known, but for folks who don't know this, many of the folks who work in Mistral 
worked on Lama 1. I think the Guillaume Lampel, I think chief scientist, and Theobard, and I, I, Timothy Lacroix. I think there's a few folks who now work at Mistral who literally worked on Lama. In my head, there's a continuum some of the work they did before, before they switched over sides. And I think it's super cool the way they handled it. In addition to this, the CEO of Mistral, Arthur Mensch, he went on Hagen Face to the Mickey model and he opened the pull request to the readme.md file and just dumped like a huge word art of the like letter M for attribution and just said, hey, how about some attribution or something like this, which was the most epic way to acknowledge that this leak is actually coming from their lab. And I really want to shout out everything they do with Flare. And this is the leak. So it's not cool to leak the stuff. I know we all want it, but uh, let's say a shop, an LLM shop that releases a bunch of open source like Mistral does, we're going to get some stuff from them anyway at some point. It's it's way better to get it unquantized and properly attributed so we'd, we'd be able to use, I think. Yeah, so just I, I found the tweet I added to, to the space. Thanks, Luigi. The literal words from like Arthur from the CEO to quickly start working with a few selected customers. We retrained this model. We retrained this model from Llama 2 the minute we got access to our entire cluster. The pre-training finished on the day of Mistral 7B release. So I will say like this, it's quite incredible the amount of progress the folks from Mistral were able to do given they, they raised the round like during the summer and they fairly, I think they started like less than a year ago or so, maybe just a little bit more. So I don't know if we know like rounds usually are PR announcements and not necessarily when they closed, but definitely a very short time for them to rise like as quick to the top of the leaderboards. A shout out to, to, to the... Uh, Mistral team, it sucks that it happened, and hopefully this will happen less with continued models. I think it's time for us to move on because we have some more stuff to to chat about, and I want to talk about I want to talk about embeddings. Let me just do a brief reset, and we will be able to talk about some embedding stuff and dataset stuff. If you're just tuning in to the live recording, you're on Thursday Eye, the space that tries to, and sometimes achieves this goal, to bring you everything that happened in the world of AI, open source and LLMs, and definitely big company APIs and vision. So everything that's interesting that happened in the world of AI that, that is worth chatting about, we're trying to bring you and chat about. And this is the second hour. We're moving into the second hour. And so far, we only talk about open source LMs. And it looks like this is the main focus of the space, usually when there's a bunch of stuff. But we're still on this, and we have to move forward towards embedding models. And so I want to just mention two things that are interesting. The folks who follow the embedding space area, if you remember, we've talked about something called M5 that I think Microsoft trained. They trained the embedding model on top of Mistral. And then it outperformed on the leaderboard of MTEB, the like, biggest leaderboard in, in embedding space. And since then, we had like multiple folks that are interested in embeddings. OpenAI released two new embeddings to replace their ADA, which most of the people used. Two new embeddings, like embedding small and embedding large. And everybody focuses on this MTEB score. However, it's fairly clear that this score is not that great. And it's very easy to overfit and to show that you're performing well on that leaderboard, however, without actually <laughs> proving that this wasn't trained as part of your embedding model. And so this MTB scores, they don't usually mm, matter that much, uh, unfortunately. However, it's this is the only thing that we have. And so s since this space looks like to be heating up, we now have like two new embedding models that we should talk about. So the first one is, I, I prepared for it, uh, from BAAI, and then it's called BGE M3. So BGE, for the longest time, on that MTB leaderboard, was the model, BGE was the model that was like small enough and performant enough to run on your own hardware. And the trade-off for embeddings is often how fast they are and if you can outspeed whatever OpenAI gives you but also languages. Like the one thing that we always talked about that the MTB leaderboard doesn't show, and we had like folks from Hagen Face who host this leaderboard talk to us about this as well, is that even if somebody releases like super cool new embedding models that like significant more dimensions, whatever, it doesn't mean that it's working well because in real world scenarios, sometimes your customers speak different languages. Most of these like 
embedding models were only English, right? So they beat OpenAI's, ADA, whatever, at, at different parameters, but they were only in English, which is not super practical for somebody who builds, I don't know, document retrieval, rag pipeline, something like this, where you have customers, you don't know what language they're going to use. And so OpenAI, they don't disclose how many languages they, they support, but they support most of the stuff that probably ChatGPT supports. BAAI, so BG was one of the top open source ones. They just released a new version. They're called BG M3. And M3 stands for different things. I want to talk about them like super quick. They added multilinguality to this embedding model, uh, which now has 100 plus languages, which is quite incredible, uh, which probably covers most of the use cases for companies that, that use embeddings for any type of purpose. They also uh, said something uh, multi-functionality or something, 8K context, they added 8K context to the whole thing. Embeddings, if you want to embed like larger documents, this used to be a big problem as well. And now they, they added like longer context. We've talked with the folks from Gina AI, who's also com incumbent in the space or, or somebody who releases models. They also mentioned that back then, like longer context or longer sequence length is important because people sometimes embed bigger documents. And they also said something about multifunctional embedding which I didn't really honestly get. The embedding, I will add this to the show notes, it's called Flag on Embeddings. It's up on the MTB leaderboards. It's pretty decent. And an additional like breaking news from Freds and Nomic looks like they're also stepping into to the embedding <laughs> space. The Freds and Nomic released, Nomic AI, the company, if you guys are not familiar, you've probably seen their Atlas product, any of you. Atlas is this way to take these embeddings from this like incredibly multi-dimensional space and reduce them down to 3D dimensional space or even 2D, and then somehow visualize them. So I think they did this for a bunch of open source data sets. They definitely did this for tweets. So if you go to Atlas from Nomic, you can like scroll through timeline and they embedded all the tweets up until, or I don't know, 5 million tweets. So you can actually see on their like embedding visualization what topics people talked about because they embedded like a bunch of tweets. It's super cool as a demo. So they also have GPT for all, which we mentioned uh, here a couple of times, like a LM Studio, similar thing that you can run locally, download models, quantize models, I believe as well. And they also do document retrieval locally. So they, Nomic released a embedding just, just as we were coming up on the space. Yeah. So open source, open data and open training code as well for Nomic's embed, the first release of Nomic's embed. And they claim it's like fully introduced, fully reproducible and auditable which is, I don't think we get from BAAI. I, I didn't see any training. Maybe I'm just omitting this. It looks like still everybody in the embedding space tries to at least compete with, with OpenAI's like new text embedding three areas or ADA. Uh, and Nomic says they outperform with the context length. They outperform ADA. They outperform text embedding three uh, on short and long tasks as well. And they're featured very well on the... Um, the problem with these announcements, as you guys know, sometimes you get a Twitter thread or somebody an email or a blog post and selectively the folks who, how should I say, the folks who decide which graphs to show, they have to show that they're better at something. So sometimes they only choose in the graph the companies or products that they're better at. Many people do this with Mistral, for example. They don't include Mistral in what they beat because Mistral beats a bunch of stuff in different metrics. So I don't know if they selected the right ones, but definitely the folks from Nomic show that the, they outperform text embedding small from OpenAI and text embedding other, which is quite significant. Like recently released from OpenAI embeddings model is now beaten by open source with a fully open data and open training code as well. That's pretty cool. I don't know about languages from Nomic, so uh, unlike the BGE, 100 plus languages. I don't know if Nomic supports like a bunch of languages as well. We're going to have to follow up with Nomic, but definitely open embeds. And one thing to mention is they have also, they're hosting those embeddings on their API and they're giving like 1 million embeddings for free. Super, super cheap and easy to get started. Evaluate for yourself and your use case, whether or not this type of stuff worth it for you to, to not go through open AI. Anybody here on stage used any of the models that we talked about want to mention? And if not, I think we're moving on to the next topic. Yeah, so sorry for the connectivity earlier. I, actually, I'm really glad and excited to see BGE as well, because I think, as you mentioned, that a lot of AI tends to be focused on English. And one thing that sets RWKB apart, other than I think you all probably introduced that, 
it's a new architecture, 10 to 100 times cheaper, uh, potentially can replace all the AI today as we scale up, is that we took the approach of doing multilingual. And that's because we have a multinational team. And this hurts our English evals, but we, we don't care. We care about supporting everyone in the team and in the world. And we also face this same problem architecturally, and we also know, knew about the multilingual problem, especially in embedding space. We just haven't gotten around to doing that. And I'm like, yes, someone has helped that. Now I can use that together with my model for non-English use case. You just heard from Eugene, aka Pico Creator, who is the maintainer and the core guy behind our WKV, which we mentioned previously in the episode. Eugene joined us, uh, and because of some Wi-Fi issues, uh, we couldn't feature his segment when we talked about our WKV, but the whole conversation was very interesting, and it's going to get released in a separate episode. So uh, look out for that when it drops soon. As you may have heard, Thursday AI is brought to you from Weights and Biases. And one of the segments that I often do on the newsletter and I decided to do on the podcast as well is called This Week's Buzz. And the reason why it's called This Week's Buzz is because Weights and Biases shorthand is wand B. And it sounds like a bee holding a wand. So we have this internal joke. Haha, get it? And so this week's bugs, this week's buzz for this week is all about internal projects. I am announcing, I guess, we're going to have a live recording with my team. So uh, my team is the Growth ML team on Weights and Biases. And in December, we all got requested, or I guess um, we all proposed different projects for adding LLM features into the business flows to optimize them using OpenAI and different other projects like that. And the team did a bunch of incredible things and my job here is summarizing and giving folks the platform and so we presented it to the whole company and we're going to do a series of live shows i think there's going to be two parts with the team so you'll get to meet the team but you also get to hear about the projects as we build them using the best practices as we know them at the time and also what we've learned what are the struggles what are the technical challenges so that's coming up on next monday that's going to be a very interesting conversation and please look out for that on our socials. I definitely learned a ton and it's going to be very interesting. So we're probably going to have part one on Monday. Watch out, watch our socials for announcements. I think 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. And if that type of stuff interests you, the, the whole reason we're doing this live is for other folks to learn from our experience. So more than welcome. This was this week's buzz. And now back to the show. The next segment is a new segment for us. And I don't even have a, a transition plan for it, but it's a data set segment. And I just want to mention that we've been talking about open source LLMs. We've been talking about all these things multiple times and multiple folks on stage here are and in the audience are the, 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 the main voodoo, if you will, is creating or curating these data sets. For many folks here, I see Alignment Labs, I see LDJ, I see Technium in the audience, I see like other folks. And this is, f f for many of these models that outperform different models or for the continued fine-tuning of, like, let's say, Mistral, uh, for example, this is the main area of interest. This is the main reason why some models succeed more than other models. We've talked with multiple folks like this. We've talked with John Durbin from the, the Bagel uh, example and his Ouroboros data set, etc. And I just want to shout out that we didn't have a full segment dedicated to data sets before because part of it was just like open source LLMs, obviously. Uh, but this is also could be the competitive advantage of OpenAI because they apparently paid uh, a bunch of folks to manually build data sets for them. Yeah, potentially Mistral as well, right? So before we get to the huge announcements, I want to like highlight uh, Luigi here. Luigi, you want to you wanna talk about the stuff that you and Argila just released for, for the copy Hermes stuff? I would love to mention Capybara because it's one of the best data sets that we get to play with. Yeah, sure. Actually, I wish Daniel from Argia was here, but uh, I guess I could speak on behalf of him. Yeah, we'll get that. Yes, they pretty much made a, so DPO is just in short, like a reinforcement learning method. And it's like a type of data. Imagine you have just a question in a data set. And usually you would just have one response for every question. 
But instead, let's say you have a scenario where you have multiple alternative responses for that question. And then you just train the model on kind of understanding and giving more importance to different ones in, in that way. And it's just a little bit more advanced way of training. And it's a standard of how people are training now to get better models. Pretty much they took the Capybara data set that I developed and made a DPO version of Capybara, which is they just generated a bunch of alternative responses for the conversations in Capybara with other models. And then they added a bunch of preference data and things like that. And then they took the Open Hermes 2.5 model, and then they continued training it specifically using the DPO objective with this Capybara DPO data set that they made. And yeah, it has really good results. It seems to improve pretty much on all the benchmarks. And they only used half of the Capybara data as well. And they didn't even use that powerful models to generate these alternative responses. So I was already talking with Daniel from Argy about a bunch of ideas for their next version of this that could even be significantly better. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to add this to the show notes. Thank you, uh, LDJ. Gia is an open source tool. As far as I, I've seen, like it's on GitHub, you can use, we use it in weights and biases to do like different preferences as well. So you can like actually run and say, hey, this is better. And then there's a, a bunch of other tools in data sets area. So the other news in the data sets that we want to cover is uh, if you like, follow Thursday at all to any extent, or if you use the, follow the open source stuff, Copybar is a great data set. Technium has the Hermes data set that been, it, it's been used by many of the like top leading, definitely the Mistral Hermes one after I think OpenAI went down for a bit, got like significant attention, but definitely other examples like the Hermes E 34B is mentioned. And this is, the data set is now open. Technium released it, I think yesterday, was that yesterday Technium? Yeah, Technium does not want to come on stage no matter how persuasive I am, even though we hang out. But I will just do it justice. Uh, this data set is quite incredible. It's open for you now on, on Hug and Face. You can go and check it out. And then I can't wait to see what it will like what it will lead because people will be able to build on top of this as well just a shout out to the data set like builder here this data set is built of a bunch of other data sets as well so definitely lmc's chatbot arena and Erebus by john durbin it's like the sources so technium annotated most of the sources as well his own collective cognition data set alpaca and evolve instruct shout out the folks from glaive sahil and anton glaive code assistant is also part of there so this is like the work that builds on other works this also makes it really hard to fully attribute license wise so if if you're listening to this and you're like ah i'm gonna use this for commercial purposes it's on you to check whether or not it's possible and you take the responsibility because given so many data sets that it builds up on top of I don't think it's possible to just like very quickly figure out the license here, but also like Slim Orca, uh, Wing, Wing Lian was here before. Uh, oh, he's in the audience. Shout out uh, Wing from Axolotl and uh, other folks. What else? Oh yeah, Platypus as well. So if you guys remember, I see Ariel in the audience, Platypus folks. Uh, we, we had a, a great conversation with the folks from GarageBand from the Platypus. So all of these like incredible data sets uh, climb into one and then sorted and filtered. And uh, it's really a great kind of release from Technium. So thank you. Thank you for that. And folks will start building even better data sets on top of this, hopefully. Folks, we're moving forward because uh, we have three more big things to talk about or two more big things and one kind of tiny thing, probably. So I'll just cover very briefly the voice and audio because we don't have we don't have our audio expertise person on here on stage but you guys know vb from hug and face his blog post i'm gonna add he talks about argmax releasing whisper kit whisper kit is extremely optimized and on device whisper for ios and max beating previous versions of whisper on those devices significantly near real time the video that they posted where they took a video and they just like almost real time transcription with whisper quality on ios devices and they released it in a way where you can just use this in your ios code which is inc incredibly cool can't wait to see what people are building with this i already use transcription for a bunch of stuff if you saw any of my videos i don't i i usually type because i still am used to the keyboard but oftentimes i would use something like super whisper which i have and just say the thing and it gets me right whisper quality but now we have this as a component to build into iOS and Mac apps that runs like super performant on most devices. Extremely cool. Whisper Kit. Whisper keeps amazing me in how fast it runs. And also there is a Parakit from NVIDIA, I believe, which is only English so far, but now it it is 
in the voice and audio category, Parakeet is now also like extremely fast. And I think it's like top one in the audio leaderboard right now, only for English. So it, there seems to be a, a race in the audio and understanding as well. Quite incredible. And I want to move on to big comp. No, I actually want to move on to vision and video because Vic, you're here on stage and you've been waiting for a while, but I really want to talk about Lava because I think it's huge news. And we talked about multimodality last Thursday. I, we always talk about multimodality. We always talk about vision things. And we've mentioned Vic Moon Dream One was the model that you released. Pharrell and Niston here released Baklava, which is a, a Lama fine tune. Lava released a version 1.6 of Lava which is a 34B model. I think they released a few models, right? But the 34B version of it achieves state-of-the-art for vision models for open source, right? So I love covering the state-of-the-art releases. Lava is definitely that for vision models because the architecture is there. I want to invite Vic to chime in because I saw that you did a little bit of a deep dive. And thank you for waiting all this time. And I appreciate your time here. Let's talk about Lava. Oh good, yeah. Lava 1.6 was released like two days ago. I had a chance to play around with the 7B version of the model, and it's actually a pretty impressive improvement over 1.5, at least as far as hallucinations are concerned. There are bits, like it was trained on a lot more GPT-4 V data this time around, and so there are bits where it gets confused and it talks about how its training data cut off is 2021 and whatnot. <laughs> But that's not the typical thing that users are going to use a vision language model for actual VLM tasks of outstanding performance. I posted a thread with a, with more details, but I'll go into the high level of why how it improved over here. So to back up a little bit, the way Lava style models are trained is you take a pre-trained clip or SIGLIP image encoder, you feed your image into it, it gives you some output tokens. Then you have a little projection model that converts it into embeddings that are more aligned with the text model and then you feed it in the text model. And so the Lava training process itself is mostly about aligning the two pre-trained powerful models together to get very impressive outputs. One of the problems with this is the image encoder sees a very small image. We downsize it to like usually something around 300 by 300 pixels. And so fine details, especially if you're trying to do things like read text in the image or if it's a document or something, tends to get hard just because the image that it sees is so small. So in this release, they came up with a pretty straightforward approach, right? Like here, rather than feeding the whole image in, let's cut it into four pieces, four crops, feed those individually into the model image encoder, and then also feed the whole image. So we have global context and they feed those five embeddings into the LLM where previously we were just doing one. So huge bump in performance due to this, but the downside is you're using up more image tokens. I just ran some tests before this and we went from something around 500 to over 2000 tokens being dedicated to the image. Oh. And we talked earlier in the podcast about how attention is quadratic. So it's not four times more expensive. It's just ballpark like eight ish times more expensive in terms of RAM to we RAM to, to run the model. The other thing they did was that there's a, there's more data. They made some changes to the data. They're smarter. Well, like just before I move to the data stuff, the stuff you mentioned about images, like breaking it down to four, this is uh, in order to create like a the higher resolution ability to understand, right? As far as I understood, okay. this is like their attempt at, at actually providing the model with more details in the image so it understands better, which we, we know exists in other models. We know that Fuyu has a different, uh, how should I say, architecture to, to do that and now they're they're implementing this at the cost of more tokens but it looks like the model now can understand higher resolution and more dynamic stuff exactly and the first place they saw this was actually the mc lava 3b project by alexander so folks listening should go check it out where he's doing something very similar and found that it improves the v star benchmark scores it done I have a suspicion that GPT-4V is also doing something similar. I posted a screenshot of their pricing model. And if your image is bigger than 512 by 512, they charge you extra for what they call tile tokens. Interesting. So they do it dynamically, right? They decide on resolution, then split. Right. Yeah. 
Another thing I wanted to add here, thanks Vic, and is, uh, let's chat about this. They changed the backbone. So they used Vicuna for a long, like the previous Lavas, correct? And this time, the few of the models now really use Mistral 7B. Finally, they upgraded to Mistral, kind of the LLM brain behind the visual brain. And also the bigger model is Nuse Hermes 2, that's 34B. So we just, we literally just talked about the Hermes dataset being open sourced. And now Lava, like the best performing state of the art model, its brain now is uh, a new fine tuned Yi uh, brain. That's, I think that's super cool. And I think that's at least part of the reason why it's state of the art right now, because just like the textual brain updated. I use this model to play around with this to tell you guys OCR is way better like significantly better. I was able to paste like full, almost full documents full of text and I received the answer that I wanted. I also pasted full documents full of text and asked questions about this. Vic, what was your experience? Did you play with the 34B model at all on their demo? I didn't get a chance to do the 34B. I was trying to run it locally. I didn't realize there was a demo. I should go yeah. do that. But yeah, they released three checkpoints. They still have a Vikuna checkpoint. There's a Mesco checkpoint and then the bigger 34B version. Cuban knows their mess. Which yeah, which I wanted to like talk with Nistan about because we did definitely chat about Quen and Quen released a bunch of their own stuff today. We didn't have a chance to cover it. Quen released Quen VL Plus and Quen VL Max, but uh, but this is they're not open source. So the Quen VL is open source. Quen VL Plus and Max are not open source. This is like the top performing open source the stuff that you can run fully and maybe a lot of this is attributed to the actual LLM brain. Nistan, we've talked about this before, even with the Quen folks a little bit and Vic, we've talked about this as well how a bigger brain behind the scenes actually makes those models understand what they see better. Could we attribute this is why it's now a state-of-the-art performance because they're banking off the a very good LLM, like 34B from News is like a very good one. Yeah, so for the folks in the audience, the, they, call them, they call them VLM, so visual language models. And ironically, most of them use OpenAI's clip model back from when OpenAI was still open. So that's like the last great model they released in 2021. And then they released Whisper and then no more open. So the way they work is the LLM only sees what the, the visual encoder gives it. And the visual encoder squishes everything down, either crops it or squishes it to just 336 by 336 pixels. That has been a limitation in it doing optical uh, character recognition, because again, there's no OCR algorithm running there. That's just like simulated neural tissue, basically, that, that's that's figured out, oh yeah, these letters are not. So every image you fed it was pretty squished. And uh, yeah, I suspect the same back then that the way that OpenAI that does it with GPT-4V, we suspect is they use a 512 by 512 and like mosaic or tile it. And that's also what Lava 1.6 is doing is doing in this case. They're just tiling in 336 by 336 images. And then the way you get the visual brain and the language brain to, to, to talk to each other, you, you train a little layer there, a little projection layer, and then they start to understand each other after some time. So the, the interesting part here is that Yelp, for example, uses 448. So then we suspect that they're just tiling the 224 <laughs> ones. And they notice that when they step up to the language models, they when they have a larger LLM with the same visual model, it can reason stuff better. And yeah, again, the issue here, as Vic also pointed out, is that when you tile four of them together, you go from needing less than one gig of RAM for context which means about 500 tokens, 576 for, uh, for 500 something for the image, and then whatever, 500 something for the response. And those each need one meg. But now you need 2,000 if you're going to tile it. So now you need two, another extra two gigs of RAM to run it. And, and stuff like that does pile up on the performance side. So if you're going to do classification, I have classifications for that store, et cetera. Awesome. Th thanks, Nissan. Thanks for, for the deep dive into Lava. Definitely incredible news to get like a state-of-the-art vision model VLM getting released to us. Some other little details, they mentioned, specifically mentioned zero-shot Chinese capabilities. So Lava 1.6 Chinese capabilities emerging zero-shot, 
that they didn't train this. Like English multimodal data is considered only, and its performance on Chinese multimodal scenarios is surprisingly good. And we've seen this in other areas where a uh, general model trained on some language could beat like a fine tune on that language. Quite interesting. It, it achieves state of the art on MMBench uh, CN, so the Chinese version. And also they mentioned like lower training costs. Lava 1.6 is trained with 32 GPUs for one day with 1.3 million data samples in total. And they say compute training data is 100 to 1,000 times smaller than the other ones. I think this is like most of the time here. Guys, we're here like two, two hours and a few minutes. We started like later, so we're around two hours right now. And I think it's time to, I know I'm getting like DMs from some folks. Uh, LDJ, you want to briefly mention it? Like yeah, I, I can quickly... Yeah, sure. I can quickly go over some things. Just apparently Midjourney CEO has recently announced that they're working on a lot of interesting hardware stuff. Mm -hmm. They haven't said more detail than that. So that's interesting. They also said they're working on video, training video models as soon as next month. And then the most exciting thing is there's something called the Lux Chat that's pretty mysterious within the LMSYS leaderboard website right now. If you try to interact with different models, it's not on the actual leaderboard ranking. But I'm talking to some people right now, including my friend Blaze, who I'll link their tweet up on the billboard. And he's saying it, he thinks it might be above Mistral Medium level. And we don't know what company is Ooh. this is. Elm City just saying that it's an experimental model with a research organization that we're working with. I'll link that in the tweet and thank you for letting me talk. Oh, thank you for That's bringing all. us breaking news. I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to hit this like little button again. Uh, so a mysterious model that ranks above Mistral Medium uh, and on the LMTS okay. thing. Well, so there's nothing official. It's not on the actual leaderboard ranking yet. Mm, and we don't have any benchmarks for it yet. But just from people's intuitions of what it's doing. It's also interestingly when you ask it who made you. Sometimes it says like Claude, sometimes it says GPT-4. Definitely fine tuned on like a, at least probably a lot of diverse sets of data. Yeah, interesting. Awesome, thank you for that. And if we mention LMCS, let's mention the stuff that we didn't get to, just super quick. Uh, Bard, or I guess Bard with Gemini Pro, over has overtaken uh, Mistral Medium, has overtaken uh, Claude 1, Claude 2 has overtaken pretty much two out of the three GPT-4 on LMSYS Arena. LMSYS Arena, again, is a, a, a score that they calculate, ELO score, and then they also use other scores to average out a what seems to be a little bit of a, a human feeling in, in models. And so that's used to be a more, not used to be, I think it's still the more trustworthy understanding which models perform which. And the new bar that was released on January 25th, Right, so just a bit after Thursday I is now the second best LLM in the world based on LMSYS, beating two out of the three GPT-4s. I found it like really dubious because the first thing that I tried is to ask it to summarize something very, very basic and it said, no, I cannot do that. And I was like, okay, this is the third or fourth time Bard releases something and I try and it's disappointing. But then it was quickly pointed out that was because I included the, the person's name and last name and Google has a bunch of like safety things in there. So it's not like the model didn't do what I wanted. It just refused to do it, but in a way that it seems like it's, it's not helpful. But the bunch of folks on LMC Serena who go and go into the arena mode and select an answer, they prefer Bard with Gemini Pro to pretty much all of GPT-4s besides the last one. And then we had a whole discussion in the group and really shout out to everybody in the green room chat for Thursday I because that chat is becoming like very powerful and I love the people who are involved in there. Uh, because we had a long discussion about like, what do metrics actually mean? What do ELO rankings mean? How do we judge performance? Does it do what I actually want? And one thing that came out of this whole thing is that Apparently, this Bard with Gemini Pro is a Gemini Pro, not Ultra, not the model that they claim beat GPT-4 just by a little bit. Just Gemini Pro, the one that we get through the Bard interface. Apparently, the API that LMC has got has internet connection and has Google search abilities. So in terms of helpfulness, apparently, when you talk to that model, it actually has real-time rag over in, in, interesting data, which GPT-4, for example, doesn't have. It has it in the UI, but not in the API that LMC has got, right? So maybe uh, we're thinking that maybe that's one of the reasons why people prefer it better, because for regular questions about 
weather or something, it would answer. Whereas OpenAI, for example, or GPT-4 will just tell you, I don't have access, I have a cutoff. So definitely models without a, a knowledge cutoff feel that are they're more helpful. Very interesting, this development. This definitely is confusing from Google because there's now uh, a Gemini Pro API and there's a BARD API with Gemini Pro, which is different, which we mortals don't get access to, only LMCs apparently did. And that beats on, on personal ranking as well. Luigi, one last sentence because I really got to summarize and then get around and start editing. Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. I just wanted to also say that this mysterious deluxe chat model that you just occasionally will end up getting if you go into the chatbot arena mode is it has very slow inferencing apparently like it's one word like every four seconds sometimes. So this seems to be maybe a very experimental, very large model. Who knows, but it's interesting for sure. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. So I, I, I think with that, oh yeah, one last thing that I wanted to mention, I personally wanted to mention, please go on my video, media tab, whatever, and check out, I had like five minutes on this. OpenAI launched a GPT mention feature. If you guys remember the GPTs that I told you about, the visual weather GPT, etc. cetera, uh, OpenAI launched a feature where you talk to one GPT, you can add on Twitter, you add mention somebody, you can add mention the previous GPTs that you have pinned or interacted with. So you can actually have a shared context conversation with multiple GPTs and I found it super cool. So it, it really flew under the radar, but I've played around with this. I think this way of them of interacting with other purpose built GPTs is like very interesting. So one example that I did, I have the visual weather GPT. The, the, the way it works, it prints out a poem about the weather before it prints out because DALI takes time, the image generation takes time. So I, I just wrote you a nice poem to read by DALI does its thing. And I saw another GPT that does 11 labs text to speech. So just somebody built an API to 11 labs inside the GPT. So now what I did is I combined the two very simply. I just like tagged at visual weather and said, give me a, a weather update. And then I asked that 11 labs GPT from the same interface. I didn't have to switch. The context was shared, which is super cool. I just asked it to go and say, hey, give this poem to 11 labs and give me give me a voiceover for this poem. And now you can like think of all the GPTs, you can combine their powers. I think it's like very powerful. I didn't want to glance over this, even though we're almost two and a half hours. So folks, this is now the almost the end of the space. I want to shout out everybody who came up on stage. Uh, thank you, Umesh, for helping you co-host and put up the links. Uh, and Nistan and uh, Pharrell, who was here before. Alignment and uh, LDJ, thank you for doing all the stuff that you do for open source, but also joining here and uh, talking about this. I want to highlight that we had a conversation with Nikhil and Daniel from Lilac. It was great. That probably conversation will be posted separately. We'll see. And the Pico creators here, Eugene from RWKV, I was very happy and in a non planned way that you joined and talked to us about future post transformers, for example. And definitely shout out to Vic for helping me like figure out uh, stuff about Vision VLMs and, and Lilac, uh, check out Moon Dream as well. I really want to say thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you for explaining to me these concepts. I love being here week to week and now I need to go and actually start editing this. With that, thank you everybody for joining. We'll see you next week and hopefully by then we're going to have some more incredible stuff about AI and hopefully by then I'll learn to actually manage the, th the time a little better. But I really appreciate everybody's time and attention and we'll see you here next week. Bye everyone.